Hi, Anansi. Thanks for joining me, brother. Hey, it's good to be here, Tasha. What's good, man? Uh, I've been very much looking forward to this and excited to see where we go with this conversation. Um, so to start, I'd love to ask you the question I ask everybody, which is just to hear about your life story and your background and anything about yourself and your history that you'd like to share. I would, I would love to hear and feel free to answer in whatever way you'd like at whatever length you'd like. All right. <sighs> the story begins in Birmingham, Alabama on January 23rd, 1989. Uh, <laughs> mm. I was born to uh, Willie and Deborah Huff. Yeah, I grew up in Birmingham. This uh, was it a medium sized I guess I would call it a medium sized city in the, the deep south of the United States of America in Alabama. Pretty beautiful, surprisingly beautiful place. Lots of trees and hills and the valley and uh, a whole lot of history, uh, a whole lot of intense history. Yeah, I was raised by my parents there, and I had two sisters, Dion and Danielle, both who were about about what six and eight years older than me. Um, I I always feel like I had a very unremarkable adolescence. Um, I was mostly I was a pretty happy go lucky kid. I uh loved video games and comic books. I had vivid dreams my entire life, from starting from a young young age. I had deep dreams, and um, what do I see about my story? What's important? Yeah, I, I ended up uh, at a, I guess a notable part was I ended up at a private school for middle school and high school. That was an interesting time because. No, it wasn't that interesting. <laughs> um, I made a lot of good friends there and had a lot of experiences, but mostly not a whole lot happened. The most notable thing I can really say about before college was getting into World of Warcraft, <laughs> which ended up being an amazing experience. I guess another thing that might be notable is I was an Eagle Scout. I was like heavy in the Boy Scouts from what? kindergarten until i graduated uh, that was cool that taught me a lot about adventure and gave me a love and appreciation for that but yeah my story really starts uh it really started at the university of alabama where i went to college again it was pretty it was a pretty unnotable it was really not much to note i was a dude who played video games and drank and hung out with people and little I don't even say a little. I was fine. I fine. I did had fine grades. Um, everything really. Uh, my story really started. Man, this is interesting. My story really started uh, my senior year of college. Uh, I'd been studying finance, uh, and I was almost done with my degree. I was a little unsatisfied with my time at the university. Like I, I went through the experience, like the financial, the 2008 final financial crisis while I was there. And I learned a lot about it and it kind of like ruined my interest in finance, but not that impactful. Um, Things really started to change when I saw this huge, this, there was this day in April of 2011 and I live in Alabama and Alabama has a lot of tornadoes and thunderstorms. Uh, one day, there was a tornado warning. Usually comes out to nothing. So we were all just drinking and hanging out and smoking weed and doing whatever, playing video games because all our classes got canceled. And then someone went outside and informed us that we all needed to take a look. And we all step outside and directly above this little house we're staying in is a giant funnel cloud. You know, the the precursor to a tornado, at which point things got kind of real because we all know what that is. And yeah, things got real weird in that moment. 
Like everybody kind of just got quiet. It was it was too late for us to go too late for us to go anywhere, do anything. And <laughs> honestly, it started to come down in form and we all like the last thing we could really think to do of was when we all took shots and like cheers each other. It was nice. It was like, you know, it was nice knowing you assholes if we don't make it. <laughs> and then this giant gigantic tornado comes down like right in front of us winds howling it's super loud it's super dark outside i'm like sh- i'm like watching myself like shake i'm just like whoa like, look at that <laughs> and you know the tornado goes blesses blessedly for us goes the other way and demolishes the town but like that was like notably my first ever experience of surrender of like being put in a situation that was completely out of my control that was totally impersonal and where I like really accepted the reality that I was probably going to die uh, and that was when things took a turn um, it just shook me up inside like I don't I try to attribute not too much to the tornado that was just a catalyst as these things are i guess um i started to get really i started to just notice my life notice a lot of things i hate about my life like never having partners never getting laid really like unsatisfied with what i had done in college really unhappy with my degree looking around like the people i was studying with and being like i don't like any of you (laughs) you know it's like i don't i don't like this thing i'm studying um I started to get really angry. I started to get really drunk. Um, I even had to drop all my classes. Like I was like almost done. I had to drop all my classes because I could not concentrate for the life of me because I just did not care. Um, and yeah, like that whole situation kind of climaxed with me. Like I was just really upset about how, I, like everything was falling apart, and I just got it was really upsetting. And I would never forget just like one day I came home back to that house, and I remember I just cursed the whole like universe to die. I just meant it. I meant it so badly. I just wanted the whole universe to end, to like specifically to burn and die, including myself. I just wanted to, like I just wanted it all to stop. It was just like all this just like self hatred and all this stuff just started coming up and I didn't know what this and having that thought that thought was so shocking and so like outside of my normal thinking that it was that was the first time I ever questioned my thoughts that was the first time I was ever like where did that come from it was like that was dark and at the same time I saw uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and I started to be like do I need spirituality? And so I started just like all these things kind of coincided to like kind of kick me into the process of like contemplation and meditation and just thinking a lot about like who I was and who I wanted to be and like what the fuck I was doing and like why was I here in this situation and why was I having these intense feelings of anger and grief and like self-hatred? And that was how I got into spirituality when I was 21. I was, I was kind of just desperate to not become a school shooter or something like that, or like watching that hatred. Like I was, I was seeing that hatred start to spill out into the world. Like I'd get drunk and say mean things and just not be a very nice person. Like my friends in retrospect were like, you weren't that bad. I was just like, oh, it felt like I was that bad. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So like, I ended up spending a whole year. I stayed in Tuscaloosa, which is my college town, um, working at Buffalo Wild Wings, selling weed, and devouring as much literature and video stuff on self help, and like doing a lot of journaling and art and making art, trying to describe what I was seeing in my head and my imagination. And I got into Taoism and Buddhism. And I was just trying to get some answers, and I started meditating like regularly. Uh, I started thinking about a lot about who I wanted to be finally I started to actually like really like 
draw it out and like think about for the first time in my life who I really wanted to be. And uh, <laughs> it's funny looking at it now, but like what I settled on it, what came up at the time was I kept hearing this, this thought. This thought kept showing up just like sorcerer, sorcerer, sorcerer. I was like, what does that mean? I don't know what that is. Uh, you know, like at the same time, you know, I was at the same time this was happening. I was like heavy in imagination, imagining all these worlds and characters and imagining this whole universe I called the the unreality. There's all these characters like there was a lot going on for me imaginatively and creatively during this year. Um, and I don't know, I just. Man, I wrote this whole little like little manifesto I called the geek struggle rant. Hmm. Oh man, it's fun talking about this. this is fun. <laughs> um man, fidgeting and stuff. Oh. Yeah, where I landed on was I wanted to be I wanted to be a visionary. I wanted to be the kind of guy who told really epic stories and created Epic spaces, epic contexts. Uh, I just really wanted to be this really creative, free spirited, powerful person. And I think I've been moving towards that nonstop for the last 11, 12 years now. Yeah, and that. That led into a lot of things like I went to Brazil to finish my degree. Brazil was the first time I really came into contact with, I don't know, this much more alive, like erotic part of myself where I like danced for the first time and I stopped drinking so much. And I I got to meet all these really cool people from all around the world and all these Colombians and stuff. And I also did some ratchet shit, like I went to a brothel. That was a terrible experience that I do not recommend. Um uh, and after that was done, I moved to decided I wanted to move to New York. I got spit up and chewed out. I came back to Birmingham. I learned how to code. And then I went back to New York specifically because I wanted revenge. <laughs> yes, I'm very proud. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, I did this whole pro program called Dev Boot Camp, this like software development boot camp, which was the most the best learning experience of my entire life. Completely blew away everything I'd ever done before. They taught us about empathy and like vulnerability and we did yoga and like we worked on coding together every day. That was amazing. I met one of my best friends there, this dude named Matthew Bunday. He goes by Zencephalon. Um, and then my world just started to open up a whole lot. I couch surfed for a whole year. almost. Not, it wasn't a whole year. It was like nine, 10 months. I couch surfed across New York until I got my first job. I am telling my whole story. Okay, sure. Look, we're doing it. Um, <laughs> um, I couch surfed across New York. That was beautiful. Like people just kept showing up to help me out and like, let me crash until this one really great dude named Elliot was just like, hey, bro, you just crash with me as long as you need until you get a job. That was so beautiful. I learned. <laughs> oh man, I was like so overwhelmed with how kind everybody was that I came across during that time period. And I started working as a software developer, which was cool. I started having money, and I started. I had my first. I had an apartment for the first time, and yeah, I started to expand and grow and learn more. And then I got really into dance. <laughs> this is okay, man. I've been through so much. Okay. So I near the end of my first dev job that the year 2016, I decided I wanted to give up alcohol for the whole year because I wanted to change how I was living. And so, and I did it. I just did it. Um, Cause I was really sick of like, there was a specific thing. I got real drunk one night and threw up on the train in, in New York. This is not classy. Um, that was that was like the catalyst for that. Anyway, like four or five months in, I was starting to get really bored. And I'll never forget, I Googled 
fun things to new, do in New York sober. And I came across this thing called Daybreaker. And it was these awesome, like sober morning dance parties. And I went to my first one. It was like one of the best experiences ever. And like everybody was so sexy and free and happy. And like the music was tight. And I like got in the dance circle and I was dancing my butt off. And that ended up becoming a major part of my life. I started going to every single one. I'm talking about for years. And then like I became a volunteer and I started like, I became a greeter, one of the mischief makers. Um mm-hmm. And I would like, you know, I'd start to like come up with better costumes and I'd get to hug people on the way in and like, you know, rep the culture. And I just kept getting really, really into dance. Meanwhile, I'm continually getting fired from engineering jobs and (laughs) I was just kind of failing my way up to better, higher, higher paying jobs while (laughs) all this was going on. (laughs) Um while all this like so like while like i'm just like slowly discovering that i am not a good nine to five worker i'm like having this explosive movement of my creativity and my style through dance and like getting into partner dance and like i started doing swing dance and like it was it was it was a time and i had this beautiful network of uh oh new york was so sick uh eventually I got fired again after I did a 10 day Vipassana sit. Um, yeah, I did this Vipassana sit. I was just like, okay, this would be a good chance to rest and figure out what's going on with me. And then I got, it was, it was a lot of work actually. And then when I got back, I realized that I just did not have it in me to keep coding or doing anything like that. That kicked off my movement into being an artist. I did the artist way. Um, I wrote a novel after that it's called An Infinite Heart I intend to write another draft someday this is a little action adventure story about this this dude climbing this giant world tree that was such a nice experience All right, we're starting to catch up with the present that was like when I was like 30 31 (laughs) all right Let me just take a sec to take it all in. It's been quite a journey, bro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I started to go through this creative awakening. Um, I wrote this novel. I like I like committed to doing a Nano Remo. And I did 50,000 words and then I realized the story wasn't done. And then I worked on it for another two months and I finished it, which was crazy. And then, uh, yeah, eventually I, I left New York because uh, I had a dream of moving to L.A. for a long time. I made the decision to... I was at a, a week-long fusion dancing retreat in uh, Costa Rica when I made the decision. That, that was a really beautiful experience and taught me a lot about the heart of dance. But I moved to L.A., pandemic hit. And I'd like to say I did a lot of cool stuff or something in L.A. The first year was me just smoking weed and playing video games and just figuring out, and just like, I don't know, just settling down from how insane New York was. Then I eventually started a business that I'd been dreaming of starting. I started this business that I'd come up with that year when I was, uh, you know, first coming into contact with spirituality and like deeply with my imagination. I came up with this company called The Infinite Mindworks, and we'd create these epic video game experiences and tell really cool stories and make cool worlds for people to play in. And I started that company. I, uh, I had been in a witch coven for, oh man, Jesus. <laughs> I, oh my God. I've done so much. <laughs> I guess, okay, to double back real quick. Starting around a little bit before I left New York and near the end of my first year of LA, I was in this 
online mystery school called Wealth run by this woman called Carolyn Elliott of existential kink fame. That was where I got into a lot into like a lot of identity play and a lot of like messing around with ritual magic a lot more than I had been up to that point. And while I was there, I got into this habit of doing this thing called gifting circles where once a month you get on a call with people and you just offer gifts. People just offer gifts for people to have freely. And I decided to come up with this gift of giving people online style coaching. You know, I take them on these imaginative journeys, these imaginal journeys to find their style spirit and figure out what their ideal style was. And then I'd have them dress up with whatever they had to embody that. And eventually I kept working on that until it became this whole service I called soul play. It became this game I play with people one-on-one. -on -one. So one of the questions you asked me ahead of time was uh, where does soul, the soul director come from? Through the course of developing soul play, which I was pretty meticulous about, I would ask people a lot of feedback questions at the end of every session. Um, my God, I'm just jumping all over the place. <laughs> anyway, I developed this service I called soul play, this game I played with people to help them embody the different identities within them. And that became, I started to sell that through this company I started called the Infinite Mind Works. And yeah. And the role I played in that game was the director and the person opposite of me would be the player and I would direct the player. Anyway, I started this company, Infinite Mind Works. I sold a couple of big packages of people for soul play. Like one month, I actually somehow made $5,000 like selling this to people and like taking them through it. And then I got tired of doing that. And around the same time, I was going through another creative awakening where I, I just felt this unstoppable urge to draw and create and write stories and stuff. And eventually I did this thing called Bufo. And I'm getting tired of telling this story. There's been so much. <laughs> um, I, I got really creative, really, really just... I started to be able to feel through my body this creative energy that wanted to be expressed. And that led me to creating and creating and creating every day, nonstop, making art, writing stories, making more art. Until I got invited to come to Lisbon, Portugal a few months ago, where I did not have the money to go, but through an insane miracle that I will not elaborate on, a lot of money came to me that allowed me to go to Europe met a whole bunch of cool people here on Twitter. Then I was in Berlin for the last two months, also making art and getting the crazy 20 day long romances. And now I'm here in London. Hi, what's up, Tasha? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, uh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Anansi. I think uh, I really feel like it's such a, precious gift to share one's life story and it's 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 there's so many strands and webs and uh themes and and it's it's messy and thick and juicy and i just loved hearing all of that so thank you for uh serving that up on a dinner platter for us it's beautiful you're very welcome mm. i am blown away by how fucking crazy this is. <laughs> yeah you're welcome, bro. And we know this is like chapter three of just a page turner of a novel. So look forward <laughs> to seeing four through 10 in the decades to come. You know, uh, I want to backtrack to your childhood. And I would love to hear, because this is an experience that I had, uh, what your experience playing World of Warcraft was like. Oh, man, that was so awesome. Um, it was it was this rare moment that I think of me being really in my element that I'd never experienced before like I was known to be a gamer by everyone who knew me but like World of Warcraft ended up being something totally different because like like one I just had a ton of fun playing it it was like one of the coolest social experiences 
of my life up to that point because I would just meet people playing the game or go through a dungeon or go go through whaling caverns with someone and I made a friend this dude named mm. Bellis and then he invited me to join his guild and then I was just in his guild and we just talked all the time and ran dungeons together and then that guild got absorbed into another guild and I made more friends and then you know the game itself was fun as hell as I think anybody knows who played um, who was around for that and then like I started doing raids and stuff and like while all this was going on, like I got like almost all the in you know, all the guys in my school, I got almost all of them to start playing, and some of the girls. It was crazy. <laughs> like, um, it was just super. Like, oh man, uh, there's a lot of places I could go about. Wow, like. The most important, the most important piece is it was my first experience of really being a part of a coordinated, like, team. Like, I'd been in the Boy Scouts, so technically I had teamwork experiences, but, like, this was my first time where it was just, like, really epic. Um, It was, like... I don't know if you ever did any raiding, but like there's these 40 man encounters, you know? And like you just get used to like working as this one giant unit with 39 other people who you've been getting to know for a while at this point. And just like having these epic triumphs against these giant challenges and like nothing I did in my life up to that point. And well after was nothing like that that experience of like coordinating and working together with a large group of people to like do something really hard and being rewarded for it and like having deepened bonds from the experience and like the sense of belonging and purpose and like focus it was so sick (laughs) god i'm that's something I've always been sad about is how I never felt like that at like any company I worked at or like have I ever felt that again since? No, I haven't. The closest I got was working as a volunteer at Daybreaker, but like nothing ever matched that experience of being like in a raiding guild. Hmm. Mm. With these people who I'd like several of which who I'd come from come up from level one to level sixty with, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. It was amazing. Mm. How did they tend to organize the 40 people groups? Yeah, we were we all like basically we'd pretty much be organized based on our class. So like or like our role. So you have all the tanks. Well, how was it organized? Yeah, it was just like, yeah, we'd be organized based on our classes. So we'd have like a warrior lead or, you know, if you were a druid, you'd be a, have a druid lead. Um, man, it's kind of far. I'm kind of far out from the experience right now. But it was just like, yeah, you'd have, depending on the encounter, everyone would have the role they're meant to play. Like I was a warrior, so it'd be my job to usually off tank, which is like handle any like minions or smaller mobs that were coming after the rest of the group or sometimes if it was an encounter where you're fighting like multiple big things you know i'd have to take on one of those myself while you know if i heal or people doing damage on my end or whatever Uh, i had a very clear like purpose to play in it and i had very i knew what my role was i knew who i was protecting or who was supporting me um yeah Hmm. Hmm. i'm um sort of reminded of teapot and the things that are brewing there and wondering what like 40 person teams might look like one day i think the most that i've been able to coordinate with is like 
three or four or five on a project right now and uh, yeah. that's been really good when that's happened but like 40 goals goals yeah uh um would you say that the the gameplay or the style of the game or the imagery or the archetypes in it have sort of influenced you in a long-term way yes um for a long time like to everybody who knew me like a, a lot of my good friends would call me Mirok, which was the name of my warrior i really enjoyed that role of being the warrior being the tank because it's your job to like get the attention of all the threats and like take the hit for everybody else and like kind of control the situation while everybody else does their work you know you're you're literally basically just holding the space for everybody around you to do what they need to do. Um, it was really cool. It was really cool. And then, uh, I don't know how else to say it would directly affect me besides just like leaving me with this, this longing. I've never found a way to quench of existing in such a coordinated, uh, large scale team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and fast forwarding quite a bit what does Anansi mean hmm. Ooh. Um, to be brief it's embodying this hmm. it's kind of me reclaiming uh my ancestry in a way, in my way. Um, Anansi is the first like African mythological figure I ever became aware of. Uh, I read American Gods and there was this character, Mr. Nancy, and I was just blown away. And then when I looked up like the stuff about Anansi and like his stories and how he, and like the role he plays, I was just like, that's the coolest thing ever. And then it just started to kind of show up in like my imaginal space and like in stories I would write or like I'd be meditating and like I'd get the like a non seat would show up and tell me things. And then mm. and then I was on the couch earlier this year and one day it was just like your name is a non seat right now. Mm. It's like go by that now. Mm. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like embody that, play in that. Mm -hmm. so I guess for me it means playing in this storytelling creative trickster role and seeing what happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hell yeah hell yeah uh i was just reflecting the other day of uh you know um there's a lot of people that i meet on twitter where i know their given name but i tend to prefer to call them by their sort of moniker or handle or you know the name that they use online and stuff i think that i think that yeah and that what i was reflecting was that that um you know i come from sort of a buddhist background and people will get a dharma name and uh i tend to prefer to call people by their dharma name if i have that connection with them because it's like uh honoring that shared context and uh seeing that in them and uh it feels very similar to me if like uh you know, this sort of like mythical name that's either given or, uh, you know, self-styled or either way, it's like this, this is more in a way more who you are at this time of life than the one that you were when you, you were a child. And uh, anyway, I like, I like thinking of you as a Nazi rather than your given name. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it always makes me really happy to hear from people, like, especially when I tell them then they're like, yeah, you're totally an Anansi. I was just like, <laughs> worse <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool <laughs> yeah yeah uh, what is uh, you know you're talking about in, if i'm not mistaken in, in sort of your mid-20s like uh you know being sort of getting these sort of like whispers of like your sorcerer 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 uh what, what does that mean to you now how do you understand that now oh oh that's a big question First, I'm going to start with is this the sorcerer still feel like resonant with me right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. All right, starting from there, it's 
a way of being it's for me it's a way of being a creative channel like i'm like a bridge between the world of imagination and the spirits and all the weird mysterious shit out there and the world being a human and uh, i guess to me it means being a a channel for magic i guess Mm. i don't even want to say man i've been trying to figure out like my relationship to the word magic lately because i'm not interested in doing magic i have no interest in doing magic for me magic is a way of being if you're if you're living right magic should just be happening mm. miracles should just happen mm. so what would is it i would say i'm a channel of as a source magic i'm a channel of magic <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh <Oof. laughs> man Hmm. so that's what being a source for me is i'm i'm this channel for whatever wants to come up from here to come down into the world and be seen Mm -hmm. whether it's strange symbols and runes weird spirits stories whatever wants to be created from that realm of myth and story and symbolism Mm -hmm. that's my job to bring it through Mm -hmm. mm-hmm to be the portal for that stuff you said if you're living right magic should just be happening can you elaborate on what living right means yeah yeah lately you know i've been living in this flowing place where i made a commitment during my time in Los Angeles and after I was in this, this witch coven and like I started to once I started to learn how to feel this like creative energy in my body this like kind of electric energy that's a very clear yes or no to things I started just kind of just completely surrender like my mental ego will to that like electric charge to that energy and and I started to create from that. I make art from that feeling. I like, I'll like tap into that and I'll just like, just be like, what wants to come through that? And like, I'll draw that come all these shapes, all that stuff. So like to me, living right is being in alignment with this creative energy, being in alignment with what I would describe as, would I describe it as God's will right now? No, I would describe it as being like living right. I would describe it as being in alignment with this, this life force running through us Mm. like and not trying to control it with our minds not trying to force it into some certain shape but letting this stuff flow through exactly how it wants to come through Mm. like no matter what um so that's what like living right to me is just like putting 100 percent trust in this creative energy and trusting it to take me where i need to go trusting it to inspire me to empower me to create whatever it needs to be created through me to empower me to do whatever actions I need to, to keep growing it. Mm. Um, and in the process of doing that supremely magical shit has happened to me like more than has ever happened when I tried to do things, when I tried to make things happen. Mm-hmm. Like now I mean, I'm sitting in fucking London. I don't, I don't know how I, Oh man. Uh I've experienced the most miraculous shit just over and over again. Just just letting this energy flow through me and doing whatever I can to just unblock it, releasing mm-hmm. whatever attachments, whatever ideas I have about how things should be, letting go of all that so this stuff can just flow through and do exactly what it needs to do. That's mm-hmm. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Can you tell me a story about something like that that's happened to you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I can tell you a lot of stories. Mm-hmm. I'd love to hear them. <sighs> okay. I guess I guess just talk about Berlin. Which I am only a week out of. So mm-hmm. we can... Um, 
the most important story I feel like I could tell about this is the story of what led to me having a very amazing relationship. One of something I've never really had before. I've never had a lot. I have not had a lot of relationships in life. Um, how do I explain this? I'd been living in Berlin, uh, again, thanks to the kindness of many people. And spending pretty much all of my time at this space called Medley, just making art. You know, when I was making all those sorcerizations, that was me going to Medley every day and basically just doing that from sunup to sundown. And there was this thing I wanted to do in I I, 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 there was this thing I wanted to do in Berlin, but it started to be very clear that like it wasn't going to happen. And one thing I could have done to make it happen was leave the country for a little while, so I have some more time to, so I have time to, uh, like recharge this Schengen zone pass that allows me to be in the European Union without a proper visa. But something told me that I had not done the thing I need to do in Berlin. You know, I had this very strong feeling that I needed to stay in Berlin even if that meant I couldn't do this other thing. I, need to, I needed to be in Berlin until the end. And eventually I met this person who came by, uh, who came by Medley one day. And they invited me to come through to their space. Um, they'd heard about, you know, my creative practice, everything, and wanted to make space for me to do my thing there too. And, uh, this created like my ego was kind of hurt about a lot of things at the time. And I was just like, no, I think I'm just going to ignore this. I'm not going to go, you know, I'm just going to like finish out my time in Berlin and create, create, create. But that energy I'm talking about, that life force, like when I, when I, when I checked in with myself about it, I was like, okay, should I accept this invitation and go to the salon? it would surge. It was a huge surge. Just like it would surge so hard that if I let, if I opened my mouth, I would have screamed out. Fuck. Yeah. It was just mm -hmm. like this energy inside of me was screaming like, yes, go, go, go to that place. Mm -hmm. And I went there that night and me and this person connected and our two like life forces, I, felt it our two life forces just collided mm. and then for the next two and a half weeks we spent a whole lot of time together and it was one of the most like mind-blowing things i've ever experienced because it was just me and this german woman like me who had spent pretty much my almost in my entire life living pretty chaste like not having relationships not having a whole lot of sex uh, all that went out the window and for two and a half weeks I had a completely different experience of life mm. uh, <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it in the least but like yeah having a lot of sex having a lot of intimate contact doing a lot of sex magic like mm. making art together like we did a whole like workshop together it was crazy like mm. it was just it was just it just happened you know what I'm saying? Like it just, it just happened. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I put myself where this energy wanted me to be, and then things just happened. Like I got one of the greatest gifts I've ever experienced in my life. You know, and I'd been like, it, it's just been this sort of thing this whole time where I just, I trust myself. I trust what this energy is telling me, and something beyond my wildest expectations happens. Mm -hmm. Uh. Let's talk about Lisbon. Um, a mutual of mine, uh, the legendary Sylvia, invited me to come to uh, Portugal to hang out and make art and see what happens with like 28 other people. And there was no way in hell I should have been able to go because I ended up with no money. I, I've already told this story. I just realized that. But like, that, that was just another thing where I just, this energy just kept telling me, it was just like, you're going to Lisbon. Don't worry about it. Just keep making art. Keep doing your thing. And it'll happen. And and the money appeared. Like, what's another example? Like, coming to London. Like, I've been here for a few days now. And was, I really wanted to go to Bali. And, like, 
coming up to the night before, like I had to leave the EU, you know, I felt out, I felt through it and I agonized about it. And I talked with people and eventually just showed up. It was just like, just go to London. It's okay. Go to London. And I just, I had a perfect place in a great, and I, I just landed in a perfect place with a great neighborhood, good people to talk to. And I'm going to go to a party on Saturday and I'm hanging out with a bunch of new people. I don't know, man. It's just, I don't know what to say about it. It's just I'm just committed to trusting myself. I'm trusting this this energy that I can viscerally feel in my body, mm -hmm. and it just keeps it keeps working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I want to ask a question about that. Let me see how to frame it. Yeah. I imagine that this experience of feeling your body and feeling that energy and trusting it and going in the direction that tells you to steering by it is something that's foreign for a lot of people. And uh, I think that I, I have something to learn from the way that you're talking about it and experiencing it. And I wonder what you might say about how to get in touch with that and how to, uh, really be directed by it yeah it's actually shockingly simple I'm very lucky a very nice woman in this witch coven taught me how to do it mm. um it really comes down to learning what the sensation of yes feels like in the body not mm. like it's not like an emotion it's not like the anything it's just like a very clear charge that I can feel in my body like like just say out loud like yes and mean it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes <laughs> you see how you're smiling yeah. like that's how I know something is like a yes for me. It'd be like, I could feel it. it's like, ah, yeah. <laughs> and I could feel this little light inside of my body. Come on. It's like this very subtle charge that I've gotten used to feeling. And I'm just constantly following that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned to do so many other things from like learning how to like stay connected to that feeling. Like, yeah, it's really that simple, man. It's just, it's really about just staying connected to like your yes. Mm -hmm. Ideally, your fuck yes, but sometimes all I get is a little subtle yes. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just like, yeah, if I, if I could teach anyone, I would just teach them to be like, know what the feeling, know what the yes signal feels like in your body, not the. Yes. Hmm. You know, I like, I use this feeling to ask myself questions or like find out what like beliefs I'm storing in myself or like, no, it is really that simple. It's really that actually that dead simple. It's just about attuning oneself to the feeling, to the charged electric feeling of yes in the body mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then trusting that mm -hmm. no matter how weird it gets because it mm -hmm. will get weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hearing you describe that, I'm, getting this sense of uh, they're almost like I've allowed myself to really follow that in certain areas of my life, just like uh, been very faithful to that. And then there's like maybe more areas that I could allow myself to lean into that. And uh, that has me curious if it, there's any way in which this has sort of been refined for you over time or things you had to learn about it or like challenges you had to face that uh, sort of added nuance to your experience of it yeah sometimes to add nuance to it sometimes i had to feel into like whether it's just like a shallow yes or like a deep yes like a mm -hmm. shallow yes like the charge will come up and it'll fade quickly and then it won't come back like a deep yes will just kind of stay a yes. Like, like I'll like contemplate the thing that I'm looking for the charge around and it'll just come up and I'll just be there and it just feels like I can flood through my whole body. Mm. And it's just like, it's like deep in there versus like the shallow one. It's just kind of like a quick charge that runs up. That's usually the sign that what I'm dealing with is just like a craving, not like a true desire. If it's a craving, it'll be like a, it'll fade mm -hmm. but like it's weird 
it's a weird thing to describe like like i figured out like how to like dissolve attachments i have to things through following this feeling like i will i'll call to mind some situation that's triggering me and i'll i'll like just ask my body questions until like this charge comes up until it like responds like with a visceral yes mm. like some like what's something i've had to clear before like recently like clearing the feeling of like mm. Here's a story. There's a little dog that I got to know in Berlin. It is very anxious and needy mm -hmm. of attention. Mm -hmm. It triggered the fuck out of me. Mm -hmm. It like triggered me like badly. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize I have like a deep aversion to like very anxious beings and like being exposed to a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. which revealed to me that I have an, that's an, that's an attachment. I have an aversion. This is a thing that I am not allowing to I'm not allowing to be as a part of my experience. And so like the thing I had to clear was it is okay to be anxious, mm -hmm. you know? And so I would feel that charge in my body it would show up. I'd be like, it's okay to be anxious. And then, you know, the charge would come up and like, I'd smile and like, it would come and I could feel it like reverberate through my being as like a very clear, like sense of like, yes, this is something that I'm embodying in my nervous system. That is, it is, did I say it's okay? Yeah. It what what was actually there in the moment was like it's wrong to be anxious it's wrong to have to expose myself to anxious beings and i'll let myself feel that charge just like stay with it and it usually always feels really good actually to stay with it but the trick is always becoming aware that the charge is there mm. but once i notice the charge I, I let it i let it come up i let like i let myself feel it just for as long as i can and i'll, I'll even keep saying the statement until the charge no longer appears and then after I did that, like after I cleared that charge around, like it's wrong to be anxious and then allowing it to be okay to be anxious. Then I noticed myself, like eventually I was just like, oh, I can be with this dog. It's just, mm. it's just, it's just, it's just a dog. Mm. And yeah, it's a little anxious and that's fine. Mm. Like it got easier to walk him and it got easier to be around him. And it, like and he stopped barking at me and shit. It was just like, oh, cool. All right, good. All right, we're good. And that's like, that's, that's, that is, that's really my main practice. I am, that's like the thing I'm practice all the time i call it allow i'm allowing i'm i'm be and just let them be done and it's like every time a little like internal orgasm because it's like this is like it feels really good especially if it's a big charge hmm. um yeah so that's that's really like that is like actually like my entire spiritual practice is feeling these charges and doing that either through making art or through like through like these these statements or noticing these places where I'm either craving or I'm averting. Hmm. It's quite powerful being able to feel those charges, like being hmm. just like developing an awareness of these charges is fucking crazy, man. And it's just like like it's really cool because like the thing i've learned is like emotions you just have to be with them emotions are just gonna be there until they fade until you go back to equilibrium but like you can you can avoid the emotions getting triggered in the first place by just feeling the charge the attachment that leads to them being triggered in the first place mm. Mm. yeah it's crazy <laughs> I learned that because, like, I became aware that this was a thing I could even do because of this book called Letting Go by Dr. David Hawkins. Mm. And then reading Existential Kink, like, added a foundation on top of it. And then, like, eventually I, I started to get practice. And it was just like, oh, okay, cool. I can do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long story short. Mm. Love hearing you describe that. Uh... Mm. What would you say that the uh, Existential Kink? added on top of the Hawkins book for you. Yeah. Existential kink started to point me in the direction of like, made me aware that there might be really fucking weird things, weird beliefs that I'm embodying, like a craving for shame or a craving for like being broke. Like I've had to clear charges around all sorts of things like that. Like seeing craving, craving for like, uh, not kind things mm, mm -hmm. and having and i would have never looked in those places for those kinds of things I'm just like noticing certain behaviors of being like why is this still a thing for me it's like am i 
am I craving this kind of bad detrimental thing? Mm. And that's what like I got from Existential Kink, where I was just like, yeah, you might actually be craving this like kind of painful thing. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of something I cleared around that. It's not coming to mind right now, but like it's fun to I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if there's like anything like any weird cravings like that I'm embodying right now. I'm not sure, but like it just made me aware. It made me aware that like yeah, I might actually specifically be moving towards these things. Mm-hmm. And it just gave me a whole lot of language around like sensation and seeking out like these sensations in the body. Because mm-hmm. like when I read Letting Go, it was all still kind of cerebral. But then, like, after Existential Kink and learning that yes practice from that woman, then it was just like, oh, my God, I'm embodying some really weird shit. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Is there anything else you'd want to say about this practice of allowing or following your yes? No. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk about art and creativity. And um, I guess maybe my broadest question to start with is something like, well, I guess coming from a a, a Buddhist background, like, uh, you know, a lot of at least like traditional Buddhism is sort of about classical awakening and, uh, you know, escaping samsara and cessation and, uh, you know, ending suffering and stuff like that. And so it's uh, interesting to hear you say that, like, for you, this life force is about creativity and making art and like showing up in the world and following your yes. And um, that seems like such a different frame. And I love it. And that's very alive for me, which is why I want to be talking to you. And um, I would just how to put that as a question. It's like, I don't know, th- this is such a broad question. So feel free to answer it. How you'd like but like why why would it be the case that connecting to that life force would lead to like creativity and art and doing things and making things in the world how do you understand that or make sense of it yeah i mean it's literally like an enlivening force like Mm -hmm. you know the feeling of being turned on and charged up you want to go do shit or like if you turn or or like if you're a hornet you want to go fuck somebody Mm -hmm. and it's just like it's like ooh, like you can't help it (laughs) Um, it was the same with like coming into contact with this energy. It's just like, yeah, it's like this energy wants to be unblocked, and the tools that stuff like Buddhism gives, like you know, reducing suffering, uh, releasing attachments, unblocks the life force, which activates more aliveness and brings it. Back. I don't, I don't know if you, it's been the experience for you, but like more more energy and more of a mm-hmm. sense of freedom and like more freedom to do what you feel you needed to do mm-hmm. um it's like the life force is actually become the, like the center of my practice like i started out being much more interested in mind stuff and you know deep concentration and stuff but like over time like so i got into things like dance and improv and then started to have this very direct relationship to the life force uh it just seems like the most important thing Mm-hmm. It's like, like my stuff is cool, but that's still just downstream of the life force. Like, it, I guess this this comes this this ties together like creativity and allowing and all this stuff. But like, one thing I notice is that my thoughts are pointing me to where I'm blocking the life force. Mm-hmm. Like, if I'm worrying about something or thinking about something a lot, that usually means there's an attachment or aversion or something. And that's usually like I use my thoughts as an opportunity to like do my allowing practice and free up free up life force to move through me which gives me like either like inspiration for new things to create or uh uh it just frees me up to do whatever the life force wants to do like bringing it back to art sometimes uh, how do i put this actually i I could use another question i'm getting lost (laughs) (laughs) well how did you start making art and how does that been a part of your path so far yeah i mean i started from a young age i was always drawing and stuff and Mm -hmm. uh i love to write uh 
I do it pretty consistently for my entire life. And then, I mean, I really started to become an artist um, in New York, like with dance. And I started, like when I started to take an interest in aesthetics and my style, and then I started doing improv and then I started writing essays and then I wrote this book and then I did the artist way. And it's just, I guess I've always been pretty creative. But like, I guess I started getting like serious, serious, like, like where it started to become all consuming, mm. uh, you know, around uh, March, April. Um, I guess like what had happened was like, I, I reached the point where I realized I need, I was, what did happen? <laughs> Honestly, man, everything I had done, I was watching kind of falling apart. And I didn't have the energy to try to force myself to do anything else. And when I got honest with myself and my yes and what was actually alive that wanted to come through me, it was making art. Mm -hmm. uh, like, especially after I did Bufo, uh, 5 meal DMT, I which was an epic experience. After I did that, like the floodgates just opened and it just became like, I almost, I come almost completely stopped consuming any sort of like external content. Like I stopped watching TV pretty much at all. I stopped listening to things. I stopped reading books. I still played video games, but like, it was just, it just wanted to come through me, man. Like, like all these images and symbols and like stories and all all this stuff just like I just felt compelled to do it like I had to do it I could feel like I could feel in my body that was what I wanted to do that was like what wanted to happen that's what this energy wanted to do it wanted to make art it wanted to pour these symbols out into the fucking internet mm -hmm. um I had to do it it was like the only thing available to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's been sort of the arc of your art practice since March or April and Buffo and so on. The arc. Oh, that's a good question. It's gone in this very like mm, arc. What is the story from here now? I guess the big story would be around like there are two main things I've been creating since then. One is expressing story. One, it was telling stories. Um after I did Bufo, I finally started to write fictional stories, which I'd been wanting to do for decade, for decades. And then I just started doing it. I started, uh, I, there's this thread called the 100 Anansi stories. I only made it to 15 before I retired the project, but around number five is where I started to tell fictional stories. Um, so yeah, around when I did Bufo, I started just feeling this urge to tell these to get these fictional characters and stories out and just like I could not help myself it was just like the most interesting thing to me to do and another thing that happened was I started experimenting with uh you know light language if you've ever heard of that like those kinds of drawings and just it came, became my own style which I called spider script and then I meditated one night and thanks to Thanks to something uh, Nina Thunder said to me about asking who wants to help me or who wants to come to me in this meditation, I saw Odin. Mm -hmm. And after I saw Odin that night, I started feeling compelled to draw these runes and create my own language from these runes. And that became this thing I call the spider nomicon and the spider runes. And I started just making those every day. And some of them would come to me in dreams. And I started drawing those all day, every day. And then, what's the arc? Um... <laughs> The arc is the arc the arc of my practice since March and April has been giving full permission to whatever wants to be drawn from my DPS to be drawn, mm -hmm. whether that's these symbols or what became these animations or stories, whatever wants to be created through me. If it if it if it's genuinely in there as a yes, then I will do it. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care what anyone thinks about it. I don't even what I think about it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just like, I just have to do it. 
Uh-huh. It's just like I have orders. It's just like sometimes I'll make things and I do not like them. You know, like some of the spider runes came out of me and I was very upset by them. I was just like, what is this? This is not what allness looks like to me or this is not what awakening looks like to me. But I could feel it. I could feel it. So I was like, oh, this, but this is the, this is the right answer. I can't, if I were to undo this or try to control it or try to make something do it, that would be violence. That would be wrong. Mm-hmm. And I'd have to just accept these things or just like let it go. And then someone would, it's, I start to just come into contact with the reality, the, these ideas, these things that are coming up from, a, from, up, from upstairs. It's just my job. That's the arc. The, the arc is realizing that, like, my job as an artist is to just be a channel for the creative divine dimension and to just let these things come out. It's like, it is not my job to judge them. It is my job to convey what wants to be conveyed through me to the best of my ability and then to let it go. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes the things just won't come together until I do some weird thing or like a month later, the thing will come out right. It's weird, man. Art is terrifying. Um, I'll be like, sometimes I'll be compelled to make things and to put flaws in them on purpose. Mm -hmm. I made this, I made this, this sigil, uh, uh, Eros and Eros and sensuality. It was one of these animated sigils I made maybe a month ago. And I I felt when I like when I make art, oh you saw me do this, but like when I make art, like you know I'm feeling into my yes. I'm like, what wants to happen right here? You know, mm-hmm. and one thing that wanted to happen on that sigil was it wanted this very specific glitch effect to happen in the middle of it, and I hated it. It was so like, I was just like, this can't be the right answer. And my whole like my essence, my creative energy was like, yes, it's the right answer. Mm-hmm. I was just like, okay. I, all right. And so I just put it out and I let that I let that glitch be there. And it's just weird. It's just like I just felt intuitively that if I undid the glitch, yeah, it'd be way more beautiful. But it'd be wrong. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's like that's that's not what it was. And so it's mm-hmm. like Yeah, that's the game. So it's this game of trust. Mm. That's the if you want if you want a very clear arc, it's just complete unconditional trust in my creative creativity mm. yeah what's next bro <laughs> yeah i'm trying to think how to put this uh you know when you're asking yourself that question what wants to happen here and you're trusting that and you're connecting to your yes energy you know you've described it as sort of being a channel as well as like um how do how do you make sense of or think about where that's coming from or uh what the origin of those that yes energy is or that life force is it something beyond you or is it i mean yeah like what what do you how do you think about that oh we're getting to the deep shit now mm-hmm. oh boy i have not thought about this so mm-hmm. we're gonna explore this together mm-hmm. <laughs> oh man um all right, I'm going to start with this thing that hit me about like a week ago. And we're just going to go from there. Mm. So something that's been really important to me, a value of mine, especially during the the era of the Infinite Mind Works and when I was doing Soul Play is revealing genius and like helping people connect with their genius and like, you know, refining and unleashing my own personal genius, you know, my own personal gift that wants to be given. Something I landed on recently that I'm exploring, I'm not going to say whether this is true or not, it's just something I'm feeling that wants to be explored, is that genius arises from the life force. Like, these genius ideas come from this creative life force. You know, these new things are born from the life force. These, you, you know, so when I think about what the, what's the origin of this life force, of this creative energy... Fuck, that's out of my pay grade. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just going to do my best to answer. Uh, where the hell do I think this? Oh, wait. I can just asked the life force. Um, where do you come from? It just is. 
That's the answer I'm getting. Mm. That's mm -hmm. what's like resonating in my body. It's just like it's just is. It's just here. Mm -hmm. It's just flowing through the universe. Mm -hmm. How it becomes bodies and brains and shit. Oh man. I don't know. This, I'm I'm really like on this thing about Eros or the life force lately. It, it seems like the most important thing for me personally to be exploring in my work and in my contemplations. Mm -hmm. Where does this come from? I don't know, man. The, the the answer I just feel in my body is just like it just is. It's just here. It just, mm. and it's getting more complex and growing. But like, oh man. Mm. I'll just flag that part of the reason I'm asking, uh, and I think this will probably be an open question for both of us, although you're welcome to say anything you like about it, but there's no need to. Uh, part of where it's coming from for me is maybe the question is almost less like where or what, but more like when, when, because when I connect to this kind of thing in myself, um, often it feels like very uh, either future oriented or like almost like a metaphor of like on top of on top of um uh like a different a different plane or realm or something like that because the, you know my honestly I'm feeling it uh, yeah well, honestly my like ordinary everyday consciousness is like you know pretty like mundane and like petty and like small i'm like you know i need to go get some food now or i don't like what this person said to me or whatever but then something will come through and it's like oh okay like this is this is this is not like ordinary yeah. passion, you know? Uh, yeah, the divine shit. Yeah. Like, bro, like, I feel you. Like, I guess what wants to be said in response to that is like, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of eternity. When I came out of doing Bufo, you know, the first thing that happened was I was one, I was just struck with a sense of overwhelming gratitude for being alive, which is something mm -hmm. I'd never felt before. I had mostly just been pretty upset about being born. But like for the first time, I felt really like excited to be alive. Mm. And I felt like I was living in this different world in that moment. And I called that world the world of abundance. And lately, I had it reframed really cool to think about it as eternity. This like this dimension that this bigger dimension where all these things are coming from flooding down into the physical realm, you know? Mm. So like what you said about like being on top of it, that feels super resonant. I feel mm -hmm. it. Like, it does not feel like it's coming from me. I really wish it was. <laughs> no, do I? It's, okay, that's 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 not what I'm going to say. What I really mean to say is, like, sometimes I am very upset with the life force. Uh -huh. Sometimes I do not like what it asks me to do. Sometimes, mm -hmm. like, even the things it makes me create, I'm just like, I don't like mm -hmm. this, but I trust mm -hmm. you, so I'm just going to do it. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> And, you know, that's small, petty Matthew yeah. or Nancy, you know, yeah. it's like, it's like, I don't like this, man. I don't, like this. I don't want this. I want something else. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, what, what, why does it have to be like this? It was like, well, there's this part of me, the part of me that knows things, the part of me that's, you know, divine, the part of me that's like, connected to everything, the part of me that's connected to everything, to the life force is like, okay, like, I get it. Like, it's important. It's like, this is what you need me to do. Mm to serve the unfolding of the universe, right? Mm. Yeah. What you said resonates. Like, it, it feels like, ooh, when? When was the thing you said? When? Mm. Now. Mm -hmm. To answer when, I would say now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And by now, I mean, like, yeah, etern eternity, the, the mm -hmm. eternal now. Fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love talking about this with you, man, because a lot of my, a lot of my everyday experience is pretty like, it's ordinary to me at this point, but it's not something I get to talk about with just, you know, people I know from past life, past chapters of my life or like, yeah. you know, just someone walking down the street or something like that. So it feels, uh, always feels good to talk about this kind of thing with people that, uh, you can talk freely about it with, you know, you know. Same, brother. I love this shit. <laughs> mm. You know, that, that that has me so curious about something of like, for me, when I'm practicing something, when I'm trying to get good at something, you know, um, there's lots of different things I've tried in my life. And like, I really have come to enjoy having an orientation of 
having like a growth edge or something that I'm working on or learning or getting better at. And I wonder if that's your experience with making art and connecting to this yes. And, or if it's just like, I could imagine it being something more like, it doesn't matter if I'm good at it or like, if I get better at it, I just, I just need to like give what's here kind of thing. Uh, how do you hold that? Is, is there sort of a growth mentality? Is there, it's just like, it's all good. To answer your question, my answer is yes. Above. <laughs> <laughs> there's like you know there's there's mind there's you know ego matt who was just like i want to get better i want mm -hmm. i want i want recognition i want to mm -hmm. like i want to like the things i'm making mm -hmm. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so there's that part of me that does want to keep growing that like you know something i'm actively dealing with, with right now is like hungering for a space for oh okay no let me let me slow down where do I want to address this first? Because all of that, there's stuff there. We'll start with the latter thing of like, yeah, on some level, it doesn't matter. I just have to do it. And what I've noticed happens is like, if I keep following my yes, I just keep naturally getting better anyway, because my yes is, it turns out curious. Mm. And it wants me to try different tools. It wants me to synthesize using these tools and like, my yes will naturally guide me towards getting better at something if it's truly a yes. Because mm -hmm. I experienced that with dance. And that was like a really crazy thing to realize. Like, oh, the things that I enthusiastically want to do, I'll just get better at without even having to think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or like, I'll just naturally enthusiastically go pursue more instruction or notice things people are doing and incorporate them. You know, there's no like, there's no resistance because I'm enthusiastic. So I just... You know, I'm just absorbing stuff. It's just like, yeah, more, more. You know, it's like it's like Neo in the Matrix. Give me more. Hit me again. He's like a machine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there is that element to it. To give you an another, to get also like acknowledge the other thing you said is there is also the part of me. There is a growth edge. Like, I guess to answer like some things I want to get better at is some things I want to take my practice to right now is. One, I want to play a little bit in 3D. Mm -hmm. not, not a lot. I just want some space to make a very specific thing. There's a character. So one thing I'll do, if you, I, I can share these later, but like one thing I like to do is these imaginal characters will show up and have been showing up for me for many, many years. And lately I've been trying to take them very seriously and give them space to exist, like either through writing a story about them or at least just drawing them or like making some animation of these characters. Mm -hmm. so like one girl that's for me is there's this part of me i call the beauty and he's this alien sex god like dragon mm -hmm. <laughs> and i was just like oh i was like oh like it started to come really clearly into my head especially after having this relationship with this awesome woman and i asked it i was like okay cool can i draw you and like make you my new profile picture he's like yeah sure but you had to re render it in 3d i won't let you do it in 2d uh -huh. Uh -huh. And i was uh -huh. like I don't know how to do that. He's like, I guess you better learn, huh? <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> so that's like something I really like, that's just staying with me. It's just like, I really want to see this character exist and do mm. it in 3D. And that's, mm. and that's something I find really helpful. Like when I have this desire around it, when I, there's like a specific thing I want to make instead of just generally learning a thing, that usually takes me way further. So I'm excited about that. Like when I have the space to play in 3D, I want to create that. That's one edge for me. Mm. The other growth edge for me is I want to make more interactive, complicated things that people can engage with more deeply. Mm. I've enjoyed making the static art and the animations, but I'm starting to get bored with them. <laughs> it's starting to get a little boring to me. And like, I also want to create things that people can engage with more, especially like I've noticed that I personally am no longer super excited by seeing like static images or like from other people as well. And I, I feel like the creative force inside of me is like, is wanting to make more complicated things mm -hmm. as it matures. And as I get better at being a channel for it, and as I make more space for it to flood out. Um, so, yeah. So I like, I would like to make a game. That's something I've wanted to do for a very long time since I was a child. And I feel like I've amassed all these skills. I know how to code. I know how to draw. I know how to create animations. Um, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to, I want to synthesize all these things I've learned over the years and make something, I want to start making more complicated stuff. And that, that's what I call like sent the synthesis, synthesizing my gifts. And I feel like I'm going to step more into my zone of genius once I can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess I've described that as my edge is starting to create more complicated, interactive, like multidimensional things. Mm. Amen. I look forward to seeing what you do with that. And, uh, what you said about making more space for it to come through, like I think that connects to my experience of it uh, with sort sort of having a conscious, rational, intellectual intention to get better at something. It's like there's a knowing for me that as I expand my skills, there's like more range for the the gifts and the you know non intellectual thing to come through, and um, like making yeah making more space for that. I mean you know, I'm getting this image of like, I don't know if I was like playing piano and I only had like three notes. It's like, you can make a song with three notes, but if you have 10 notes or 20 notes or whatever, like you can do something more interesting with that. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes forth as you like explore more complicated projects and 3D and games and stuff like that. That's going to be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I got some dreams about that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Is there anything else that feels alive for you that you'd love to talk more about or uh, converse about? Something is alive. What is alive? What would I like to talk more about? Hmm. Um. I'm not quite sure. There's something sitting in there. Was it about the was it about games? No, was it about the something art, something creativity. Hmm. I guess I'd love to hear more about how you relate to art right now. Like, um, I've been having a lot of fun watching you like make more and more illustrations and experiment more with the tools and stuff. And forever, I'm still. Ever since I heard you use the word meta wave, mm. it just has not left. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I guess, how do you relate to the, to the creative energy? Mm. How does it appear for you? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, something I'm, uh, this is like zooming out a little bit, but something I'm seeing as a trend, and I, I heard it in this conversation, and I've you know, seen in my own life and heard in a few conversations recently is there seems to be this arc that happens for people, maybe, maybe especially in, in their like late twenties, early thirties, where people can kind of like think that they're going for one thing. They have some archetype in mind and they're like, I'm this. And it's like, you know, you go for that and you learn something from that and that's good and that's fine. And then one day you wake up and it dawns on you like, oh, there's a totally different archetype than what I thought I was going for. And I got a bit of a sense with the, of that with you talking about like sorcerer, sorcerer, you know, or, you know, um, and of course it, it evolves over time and your self-understanding evolves and, you know, your concept of it changes and so on. But like, you're like there's a different direction planned for me than the one I thought, you know? Yeah. Um, and oh, um, yeah. I think that happened for me because, you know, I was in a, in a monastic training and I was like in this Buddhist context. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a monk and like, maybe I'll be a teacher and like, I'll get enlightened and like free myself from samsara and then I'll free other beings. And like, that's the good thing to do. Like, cause that's what it says in the sutras that you should do. And I trust the Buddha. And Like uh, I still feel so much connection to that lineage and so much gratitude for it. But um, eventually I was just like, I'm, I'm putting myself in a box that's not me, you know? And like, that's, that's just this, this being in this life doesn't fit into this box. And um, uh, I think I feel much more called to the path of service. And then the sort of archetype that's arisen in that is one of like a messenger or Mm. a prophet or my own preferred rendition, a mailman, (laughs) because that doesn't have any of the connotations of like, oh, I'm prophet, you know? (laughs) It's like, no, very mundane, like, I've got mail kind of thing. Um, and so I experience messages coming to me and then I write them down. Like, so if you have happened in this call, maybe you see me typing, like, oh, I gotta yeah. send that one out later. Like, got a message, yes. cool, you know? Uh, and um, 
you know, I'll write them down. And, you know, a lot of times they're, they're for me first and foremost. And then it's like, I'll share them with the people that it might make sense to share with. And sometimes it means just this one specific person needs to hear this thing or like, oh, I'll tweet this out because I think this would help more people than that. And that's, that's sort of intimately related to this aspect aspiration to be of service and be of benefit of like, hey, if, if this message can help someone, then I want to make sure it gets to them. And um, I think words have been really my primary medium for so long, like I've always been a very verbal person and reading and writing and talking and asking questions and research and, you know, all exploring all kinds of written mediums, you know, a lot of blog posts that are nonfiction, but like fiction and like uh, memoir and, you know, short stories and poems and this and that and um feel very like verbal but then in the last couple of years it's really last year or so it's opened up as like hey what if we put art in this and put visuals in and yeah. i just see so much unlocked with combining visuals and um and words and that's something that's really my edge right now is like how to i know that i have these messages that want to be shared and that i want to put out there and how can i grow my capacity in making visual art so that it just like really hits someone like oh wow that's that's the thing i needed to hear and i feel so alive when that happens because um i know what each of these things means to me and and how precious they are and and if, if it is if it can help someone then then that's that's what i wake up for and i think um i think that's a big part of it and then really just trusting every idea that i have like mm. all of ideas for service projects or um, ideas to have someone on the podcast and like, or, you know, whatever it is, I try to trust my ideas. And um, yeah, it's, again, like, it's kind of a mental thing. It's like very, there's been a lot of effort and time put into this noggin. And so it's like, I'll use that for this and trust that. And like, weird idea comes to me. Like, a lot of times they'll be really weird. I'm like, oh, I've never heard of this before. This has never been done before. I don't know anybody that's done it like this before, but okay like here yeah. we go and those ones the, or if i'm scared of it if i'm scared of it it's like ooh, that one's going to be super juicy that's going to be explosive so uh then i really try to double down on the ones that scare me and uh yeah yeah that's that's kind of how i hold all of that i resonate with all that uh-huh. but yeah like you know when you say trusting every idea that comes through yeah like giving everyone at least at least yeah, like I feel that like exploring every idea that comes through at least if it doesn't get manifested, you know. Mm-hmm. Um oh man. Uh what do I want to say? I don't want to spot that. Have you ever read a book called Big Magic? No, I read an excerpt of it the other day, but I haven't actually read all of it. If you ever have the space for it. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend it. That mm-hmm. book actually had a huge influence on me, like before I got really deep in my creative journey. But like, she talks a lot about, you know, like treating ideas like like living entities, mm-hmm. you know, like tr- taking them really seriously. Being like, sometimes when I'm making some pieces or like making animation, like I'll talk to it and I'll be like, are you cool with this? Mm-hmm. Or like, do you want me to work on you today? Mm-hmm. Like, do you want me to work on you here? Or like, would you like me to listen to some specific music? Well, like, you know, this one piece I was working on was just like, yo, I would love it if you just listen to Purple Rain on repeat. And I was uh-huh. like, okay, we can do that. <laughs> I think you might, I think you get a really big kick out of that. It's like, it's, it, 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 it takes the game to such a more fun place once you start to really take ideas seriously. Yeah. Like, start to treat them like alive, man. Wow. It's crazy. I think, I think you'd have a lot of fun with that. Wow. That's definitely something for me to explore. I mean, you know, I was on this this Twitch stream that you did recently, and that was definitely mm-hmm. like such a, a really like a transmission for me. It was watching you be like just a, as you drew like ask like what wants to happen here and see you do that again and again and see what came out. And I've definitely been like that's been that's been transmitted. And I've been do, trying to do that in my art, and um, I think yeah, I love what you're saying of like pointing to like really trusting ideas as as beings and the live persons and. I've, I've, I've practiced that a lot with, um, it's really important to me to do that in a certain way with, with animals and plants and the earth. And, um, you know, I, 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 one of my strongest held sort of ethical orientations is, is, uh, you know, love for non-humans. And Mm -hmm. I, I'm getting the sense of like extending that to ideas, which I do have such reverence for, but I, you know, haven't done what you're talking about, like asking them questions or treating them with that kind of respect. I love that. I love that. I'll definitely try that. Yeah. Mm. 
big yes for me in my body having this conversation. Same. Same. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lit right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling it. I'm like yeah. hot right now. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> huh. 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 Do you have any sense of like, one thing I'm, I find myself curious about is like time scales and like, yeah, maybe like your decisions to travel places or like make art like is it something of like just now this moment today i have no idea what i'm doing or, or are there any like plans that are in place where it's like i know this is coming and i'm like putting together the resources to make it happen drawing the dots making the connections like how do you experience time is it very much a today this moment thing or there is there's like future aspirations that are clear to you or how do you relate to all that i do have like sometimes things will show up that will be like pretty strong yeses that are kind of far out. Mm. And I'm just, I just have to kind of trust that like, if I keep following my yes today, that's leading me there. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the game of trust is just like trusting. How do I put this? I do like to set big intentions that come from that place of yes. A big, a big intention I put out there that I really felt into for my yes on the new moon was like, well, that was on the new moon, but I did this mir this workshop with somebody about like calling in miracles, and a miracle I wanted to call in was being a world renowned creator mm. with, worth over a million dollars, right? Mm. And part of the game for me is like one trusting that that really was like real, that was real, and then two trusting that following my yes day by day is taking me closer to that. Um. So yeah, I like I'm increasingly making space to find out like what longer term desires I have and they're trusting that today will bring me there. Mm -hmm. There's not so much planning anymore just cause like, at least for instance, this, this journey I'm on, it's pretty unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> there's a lot I have to just let go of. And like, sometimes I'll have a desire to go to a specific place, but the flow is like, you're not going there. You're going here. Mm -hmm. Um, and trusting that all the experiences I'm having are like, like one thing I'm like, to give you an example of how this game of trust is working, trusting that something I do a lot is I go for a lot of walks and I follow my yes around on my walks and they'll just take me around the neighborhoods and like, I'll just kind of absorb the surroundings. And usually I have ideas or feelings come up in the process. And I trust that going on these walks will unearth feelings, attachments, desires, whatever. And like one thing that was unearthed today you know, going on this walk, being here in London, like, you know, coming into contrast with seeing how my situation is preventing me from doing more of the deep work I want to do. Ugh, this is hard to organize my head. Trusting that the situations that my guest brings me into will trigger further deeper feelings that lead me towards where I want to go. Like today, I I found myself craving feeling into what's a really strong, loud yes for me you know, as I go, as I'm in, entering this kind of confused part of my journey. And something that showed up was, was like, I would really like somewhere to do very deep focused work for three months with little to no human contact, with little to no inference, like interference from the world, just three months to go really hard, deep concentration and synthesize my gifts. Mm. And that was triggered from being here in London today, following my yes. So that's that's kind of what's happening it's just like i have these long-term ambitions that i trust are alive and if i mean if something is meant to happen i'll let go but i do let the longer term things show up and i honor them and i trust that if they're meant to be what i'm doing today is taking me there mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> i love that i love that that's very clear it's like being very present now having desires or ambitions or clarity about the future but not fixating on planning it or you know needing it to unfold in a certain way yeah because mm. it's 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 too dark i can't i can't see you know that was something <laughs> i was really it was, it was too that's something i was really upset about today it was just like uh -huh. i noticed i noticed this very strong desire this aversion out this craving i had for certainty to be able to be like i want to know where i'm going mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's like i know what i'm i know what i desire but like i don't i don't know where i'm going like you know it's like i don't it's trust man i'm just those 
those are the arc words of my life right now. It's just trust, trust myself, mm-hmm. trust. That's what I say to everybody is trust yourself. That's, that's, that's all I got. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Huh. How do you relate to that when you really want something to happen a certain way and then you you get clarity? It's like, oh, it's, it's not going to happen that way. Uh, how do you, how do you relate to that sort of emotionally? One, make space for the upset, the grief, the disappointment. Mm. It is what it is. Like, I really wanted to go to Bali from mm-hmm. Berlin. And it became very clear for that to happen. I'd have to force a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it even felt like a yes in my body that, that that is somewhere I need to go. That was something that showed up clearly. But it was just like, you know, crunch time was coming down. I literally had one day left in the EU that I was allowed to be there. Mm-hmm. and i received a very clear flowing invitation to london you know, if i mm-hmm. went to london the way was paved mm. you know and yeah it hurt honestly how it relates to it it hurt it hurt to have to be like i can't go straight to bali i can't force this and then yeah there was some grief and i got really triggered for like hours mm. and i just had to be with it and breathe and let go and just breathe until it passed. And then I'm now I'm here in London and things worked out perfectly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, and that's another little reminder where it's just like I have to trust the plan, I have to trust the flow because it keeps working out perfectly, even if it's not exactly what I wanted or how I wanted it. It's, and it's and that's the thing that keeps happening. I, you talk you talking about how I relate to it, you know. Even when I'm disappointed, even when my idea of what's supposed to happen is disappointed, I'm bolstered by the fact that the thing that happened instead was perfect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is how my faith grows. That's how my trust grows. It's just like, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. So. We talked about sort of growth edges with your art practice, but do you feel like you have any? growth edges on this level with trusting and your connection to what your life is about and the universe yeah i do have some growth edges like i don't know if they're even edges because like the only way i can grow the only way i can face those edges is by it's just continuing forward mm-hmm. there's no like like active things I can do mm-hmm. <laughs> besides mm-hmm. just continually saying yes to what, like I'm mm-hmm. not even saying that's not how it works. It's by continually honoring what's true in each moment. That's all I can do. And just noticing, you know, the growth edge there is just getting better and better and quicker and quicker at noticing, okay, I'm craving, I'm clinging to this outcome I want, or I'm clinging to this thing I really, really want and making space for me to let go of the charge there. Mm-hmm. and i'm getting faster and faster and like noticing more but like it's and you know there's just i'm sure there's all sorts of unknown completely illegible cravings i'm having right now that i'm gonna have to face when they just show up or like mm-hmm. when something happens in the outside world that hits me you know, it's just, there's growth edges and i can't see them mm-hmm. and that's even more frustrating yeah <laughs> uh, well, part of where the question comes from is just feeling, again, a kind of kinship of uh, being on different but related paths at sort of similar moments and junctures in our lives. And like, at least the way I experience internally is like, on the one hand, there's like some real clarity and some real wisdom. And it's like, this is working. This is good. Keep going with that. Like, you got this. This is a benefit for you and the world. Good job, Tashin. Keep going. <laughs> and on the other hand, like it's like, yeah, I still have stuff to figure out, still questions to answer, still have problems to resolve, patterns to unfold, you know, like and I have a sense like, oh, there's this one and there's this one, and like, yep, probably got something there. No, uh, there's probably a few lurking in back that I'm not even aware of. And yeah, <laughs> those will unfold in time and take their time to heal but i get this sort of kinship talking to you of like yeah you really got some good stuff going man like your art and you know your journey and putting your your stuff out there and trusting your yes it's like hell yeah i love to see that and um 
I love to hear about it in this conversation. And, and yeah, that's sort of what had me curious about that. It's just like, uh, uh, guessing there were similar, similar shaped things for you. Yeah. I have some, uh, one, I, I love that. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that. Yeah. I feel a lot of kinship with you right now at this moment. Mm -hmm. Cause we're definitely, it definitely, I recently realized that I'm on a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yep. <laughs> so yep. I get yeah. you, I get you a lot better now. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> this shit is serious. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh man. Um, some growth edges I feel like I, I do want to name. Getting better at resting. Getting better at resting and allowing myself to rest. And two, like, how do I put this? Is there actually something that wants to be said? Or no, I'm forcing it. I do have some wishes. Mm -hmm. I do wish that. I had a deeper, more powerful meditation practice. I would like to experience things like the jhanas and stuff like that. Mm. I'm reaching this point of like resignation where it's like, I need to go to a retreat if I'm going to work on that. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen like on the road like this. The mm -hmm. best I can do on the road is keep letting go of attachments and stuff as they come. I would like to like have a deeper meditative practice. I'd like to have a deeper like, I would like to be able to explore the inner world more deeply but right now the external world seems to want my attention <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh -huh. i feel like i forced that answer mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah that has me curious about for me courage and bravery have been such a theme for me recently and i wonder if there's anything that has come to you so far in your life about courage and bravery and fear and anything you might share about that i'll speak about fear first mm -hmm. something i've been finding a lot of power in is acknowledging my fears like really acknowledging and feeling my fears the way i do with like the rest of my allowing practice because sometimes I don't allow myself to be to acknowledge that, like, oh, am I scared right now? Oh, I'm fucking terrified. Like, am I scared right now? Or like about this journey? Am I scared? Yeah. Like this journey is really scary. You know, my mind keeps screaming at me. You should just go back home. Mm -hmm. Like New York is right over there. You just go back to New York and lay mm -hmm. low and find somewhere to work and like focus on making money and stuff. But I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so the courage for me is in letting the fear and the craving and to like be safe and be somewhere known and have space. The courage is like want the courage is is the trust, the faith. How do I put this? What do I what do I want to say here? I've replaced courage with faith lately. It's not so much about being courageous anymore or like moving past fears. Like, no, I just what do I want to say here. When I think about courage, courage is like doing something despite fear. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to let I just I just want to acknowledge my fears and just let them go. And mm. let them, I guess, I guess, I guess you could call that courageous. It doesn't, no, that doesn't, no, that doesn't resonate. I'm just gonna be honest with myself. The most important thing to me is to allow my fears to exist and allow them to pass and have faith that the, the journey I'm on is good and right. Because there's a lot of fear, there's, there's a hell of fear. Just mm. like I still, uh, I'm being, I'm being helped out by a lot of people in a lot of ways, but there's still just like this overwhelming sense of like, what the fuck am I doing, man? Like, uh -huh. where is this going? I can't see. Like, it's, it's, it's hard, man. It's like really <laughs> hard to just, to just be completely unable to see what's before you. Hmm. And, and, 
And like what makes it harder is that like, you know, I keep landing safely. Mm-hmm. And so it's just like, I, I guess that also makes it easier, you know, landing in London, knowing like, okay, if I'm in London, there's clearly like an important purpose. There's like some, some gift I'm meant to give and receive here. Mm-hmm. But there's still that part of me that's just, that just wants the comfort of the certainty, that wants the comfort of the known, that wants to know like, okay, we are here in London to achieve this and this and this, and then we'll leave when those things are done. <laughs> and I am not allowed that. Yes, yes, totally. <laughs> I have to just get up every day and trust that every moment that I'm saying yes, that everything I'm experiencing is leading me to this moment where it's obvious or like where you know I've been struggling I was struggling today I mean just today about like what am I doing here in London and the answer that keeps coming back to me when I consult my energy is like it's just like just get through this weekend mm. that's all you have to do just get through this weekend mm. <laughs> you know and like and the craving for the certainty is so strong man is mm. it is like I've never, I've never experienced so clearly this, this craving, this desire for certainty before. Um, I've never, I've never had that so clear in consciousness before. And that's, that's another beautiful part of the journey. This is being revealed to me through this experience, which confuses things even more because you see where I'm going? Like, mm-hmm. It's insane. Mm-hmm. Life is bad shit crazy. Mm-hmm. So, and the fear will pass, and the faith will grow stronger. Mm. Maybe some of the fears will come true. Then I'll live, or I won't. And that's the game. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, that's all I got. To say. <laughs> it's easy to say over here, but uh, yeah, knowing about your journey and really from my own experience with being on this sort of a pilgrimage it's uh it's like yeah you're on the journey like you got this uh, <laughs> it's good that you're doing that uh so uh, i don't know it's easy to have faith over here on my side because i'm not the one that has to you know go to london instead of bali or uh you know be in that pain of the fear of uncertainty and stuff like that but uh you know, as you experience it, but over here, I'm like, yep, that seems very good to me from over here. Like, keep going. <laughs> yeah. 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 I trust you. I trust you on that. Thank you, bro. Mm-hmm. Anything else you'd like to talk about? No. Excellent. Ooh. Excellent. Well, this has been a lovely conversation. I really appreciate you sharing your heart and your life and your time and your wisdom. It's been a beautiful conversation and uh, I'm I'm so grateful that you uh, took the time to talk with me. So thank you. You're very welcome, brother. Thank you for inviting me to do this. and Thank you for all the kindness and all the the good vibes you've been spreading since I met you. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're a good dude. (laughs) You too, man. You too. Mm.